The best archaeological discoveries aren't the ones that you can pick up and understand immediately. They're the ones that require extensive study and research before we can fully understand them. The more we study them, the more we find out about the lives and cultures of our ancient ancestors. Every amazing artifact you're about to see in this video is like a mini history lesson. If land is transferred from one person to another today, a digital record of the transfer is made with hard copies available on request. Things were a little more set in stone in ancient times, and we mean set in stone quite literally. This is the Kuduru of Melishihu. The inscriptions and carvings on its surface are beautiful, but they also serve a practical purpose. They contain records of gifts and the bestowing of land to people by the various Kassite dynasty kings of ancient Babylon. The fact that it's Kassite helps us to date the stone artifact, which is approximately 3,200 years old. The most surprising of all the transactions it details is the transfer of four regions of cultivated land and all the settlements built upon them from King Melisipak II to a man named Marduk Abla Adina, who's described as the king's servant. Historians can't agree on what's meant by this. It would be highly irregular for a king to give whole towns or villages to a servant, so Marduk Apla Adina could be the king's son, his nephew, or even his lover. British East Asia India Company soldier James Lewis led a double life in the 19th century. He was also known as Charles Masson, and in his guise as Masson, he was a noted archaeologist. Arguably, the greatest of all his discoveries was the Baimaran Casket, which he found during his stay in Afghanistan in the 1830s. It's often described as a reliquary, but there's no evidence that it ever contained human remains. However, it did contain some very controversial coins. Both the casket and the coins date back to the 1st century BCE, and the latter are stamped with the name of Indo-Scythian king Azaz II. The controversy here is that several historians don't believe Azaz II ever existed, and that the person thought to be Azaz II is actually Azaz I returning for a second reign as king. Just as controversial is the depiction of the Buddha on the casket's decorative inscriptions, which are said to be the oldest known depictions of the Buddha in any form and show him in atypical dress and pose. Archaeologists are confident they have the age of the artifact right, but the combination of coins from a non-existent king and an unfamiliar Buddha makes many historians view the Bimeran casket with suspicion. During the Second World War, the Germans believed their Enigma code machines would help them win the war. What they didn't know is that British scientist Alan Turing and his colleagues cracked the code in 1941 and understood all of their coded transmissions. The Nazis protected the code machines even in the final days of the war, going as far as throwing them overboard from ships and submarines to prevent their capture. Experts think that's how this one, Enigma code machine M522, ended up on the seabed close to Flensburg Fjord in Jutland, where it was found by a fisherman in the 1990s. It's been on display in the Post and Tele Museum in Copenhagen, Denmark ever since its discovery, but in 2016, researchers found out their exhibit was even more special than they already believed it to be. By comparing records of serial numbers, they discovered that this is the oldest known surviving Enigma machine in the world. The first Enigma machine was invented in 1932, and while this wouldn't have been built that year, it probably already existed by the time the Second World War broke out. An experienced archaeologist will see dozens of tombs during their career, so it's worth paying attention when one of them describes a tomb as exceptional. In March 2015, this exceptional tomb was found in the Champagne region of France, close to the town of Laval. Experts say that the tomb is approximately 2,500 years old and was most likely built for a Celtic prince. If they're right, it proves there was some cultural fusion happening in Europe 2,500 years ago. The Celts mostly kept to their tribes, but some of their figurines, carvings, and other artifacts recovered from the tomb show ancient Greek and Etruscan influences. 
The burial mound is enormous, measuring 130 feet across the center, with the suspected prince buried in his chariot right at the heart of it. Chariot burials were considered a significant honor among Celtic tribes, but the chariot wasn't the only thing that this person was honored with. He also went to his grave with a variety of iron and metal goods, including a stunning bronze wine cauldron. Historians think the Celts probably didn't create such objects themselves and instead obtained them through trade with their neighbors. Archaeologists aren't the only people with a keen interest in ancient artifacts. Criminals are always looking to get their hands on them too. There's an enormous black market trade in valuable artifacts, but sometimes those black market goods get intercepted by the police. In 2015, police in Tokat, Turkey, managed to seize this incredible 1,000-year-old gold leaf Bible. It's one of the most spectacular Bibles of this era ever found. The language inscribed upon its pages is ancient Assyrian. But what makes it especially unusual is the number of illustrations upon its pages. Many of them are pictures of Christ looking very different from the way he's portrayed in Western Bibles. The cover of the tome has been almost totally destroyed by the ravages of time, but the 10 pages within it are in surprisingly good condition. Finding out who made it will probably never be possible, but an analysis of the pages suggests it was made in Anatolia. Very few Christian artifacts from the Dark Ages have survived to the present day, so this rare artifact might yet shed new light on how the religion survived and progressed during those years. How many archaeological questions can be raised by a simple, decorated seashell? Well, take a look at this one and find out. It's a type of ornamental seashell known as a gorget and was found in Newtown, Ohio, USA in February 2015. The image etched into its surface seems to be half bird and half cat. Three holes have been drilled into the artifact for unknown reasons, although it's possible that the one in the middle allowed it to be attached to a wall or perhaps even a piece of clothing. Half-cat, half-bird designs are usually referred to as griffins, but the Native Americans aren't thought to have had any concept of such a creature. Instead, historians believe that this might be an abstract representation of a Carolina parakeet. The bird is extinct now, but would have been a common sight in the area when the seashell was made 1,500 years ago. The shell itself has been traced to either the Gulf Coast or the Southern Atlantic region, which implies it was traded across a long distance before it was decorated. Was there a ceremonial importance to this, or is it just a 1,500-year-old doodle? Nature sometimes gives archaeologists a helping hand when it comes to making ancient discoveries. Heavy rain or storms can disturb the top layer of soil, revealing objects that have been buried for centuries. That was the case with this stunning 3,500-year-old Egyptian seal, which was found in Karnai Hatan, Israel, by a hiker in February 2016. The area is known locally as the Horns of Hatan on account of the presence of a twin peak volcano that's been extinct for thousands of years. There was a fortified citadel here in the Bronze Age, which probably explains the presence of the Egyptian seal. The hiker handed their lucky find to the Israeli Antiquities Authority, which was able to date it quickly because of the design of the scarab on its seal. It's a specific representation of the Egyptian pharaoh Thutmose III, who ruled between 1481 and 1425 BCE. His cartouche also appears on the tiny seal. It was Thutmose who set up a governmental administrative system in Canaan, so his influence was felt keenly in this part of the world. The seal probably belonged to one of his emissaries, who would have used it as proof of their authenticity. Our ancient ancestors had ways of marking time that didn't include clocks, and they also had ways of mapping the stars that didn't involve telescopes. Combine those two things together, and you get something like this star calendar from the underground library of King Ashurbanipal in Nineveh, Iraq. The library, which was built roughly 2,650 years ago, is thought to contain the sum total of all Babylonian knowledge. There's an enormous cache of clay and stone tablets in the library, 
but perhaps none so fascinating as this flat disc. It's inscribed with the names of the Babylonian months written in Assyrian cuneiform and also features the names of important stars along with their positions in the night sky. Experts think that the calendar combines elements of both the solar and lunar cycle to provide a definable and predictable beginning for each year. Based on this, the Babylonian New Year happened around the time of the spring equinox. This might only be a fragment of the full calendar, but it also shows that many of the constellations we recognize today were first recorded by the Babylonians, who passed them on to the Greeks and then eventually to us. Back in the summer of 2015, archaeologists conducted an extended dig at the site of Kirbet el Ica, not far from the Sea of Galilee. They were hoping to find artifacts that might help them to date the settlement of the nearby hills, and they found exactly what they were looking for. This bronze tool, which historians believe was used to shovel incense, is around 2200 years old. This is the first hard evidence to support a theory that Kerbet el Aika was founded 2300 years ago before being destroyed about 200 years later, going on to be repopulated by non-Jewish people in the 3rd century and then coming under Jewish rule toward the end of the Hellenistic period. The style of incense shovel is distinctively pagan with Greco-Roman influences. It might even have been imported here from Rhodes or coasts rather than being a product of the local people. Items like these would have been considered luxuries by the standards of the time, so whoever owned it presumably lived a comfortable lifestyle. It's even been hypothesized that the first occupants of the area were a community of Gentiles and pacifists who were easily crushed by the Hasmonean dynasty, but further hard evidence would be required to prove that. Many of the world's ancient civilizations believed in the powers of mystic shamans, supposed wise men who had the power to heal the human body and perhaps also predict the future. The precise powers ascribed to a shaman varied from location to location, as did the outfits they wore. It wasn't uncommon for a shaman to wear a mask, but most such masks weren't quite as terrifying as this one from Tibet. It was used during either the 13th or 14th century, and it's carved from a single human skull. The amount of work that must have gone into creating the mask is incredible. It's been lined with brass and gilded copper, and then decorated with coral, silver, and gold. The intricacy of the carvings at the top of the skull means that it must have taken days just to craft this single mask. It's likely that the shaman who owned this also owned several more in case of breakages or loss. As for what the mask might have symbolized, we have no idea. One theory is that wearing the face of someone who's died might allow a shaman to communicate with the afterlife. But that's just a best guess. You don't have to go back thousands of years in time to find curious inventions and artifacts. Here's one from 1870, a mere 150 years ago. In historical terms, that's little more than the blink of an eye. It's a Mauling Hansen writing ball and was hailed as the greatest invention of the year. Two years earlier, the typewriter had been invented, but the writing ball was briefly considered to be a better alternative. Once you were comfortable with the unusual positioning of the keys, typing along the ball was apparently faster than typing using a conventional typewriter. After exhibiting the machine all over the world, Rasmus Malling Hansen made it commercially available in 1875, but continued making improvements on it all the way up until his death in 1890. Unfortunately for the commercial prospects of the writing ball, every single unit of it had to be handmade, so production was slow. It was far easier for offices and writers to get their hands on mass-produced typewriters, so typewriters won the commercial battle despite the inferiority of the product. Had Malling Hansen made his machine a little easier to build and replicate, the familiar QWERTY keyboard would never have caught on as an idea. You've probably heard it said that people didn't have to lock their doors in the olden days because nobody stole from their neighbors. Your parents might have said it to you about it in their youths, and their grandparents probably told the same story to them. It's always been a lie. People have been locking their doors to protect their property since the invention of the lock. 
In evidence, here's the oldest known door lock in the world. It comes from Egypt, and it's approximately 4,000 years old. It's actually a remarkable technological achievement for the people of the time, with both the lock and the key made out of wood. Keys warping or breaking must have been common problems for the locksmiths of the time. To add to the practicality problems, the average key was one foot long, so it's not exactly the sort of thing you'd pick up and take out of the house with you. Also, the door could only be locked or unlocked from the outside. You could lock your home if you were going out for the day, but if you were inside your home, you had to leave the door open unless you climbed out the window and locked it. We've rolled out the red carpet for you at Cine Mysteria, where you'll be gripped by the highs and lows of Hollywood legends. We dig deep into movie mysteries, unveiling the secret subtext in epic films and the failures that make franchises flop. It's a terrific tour of silver screen success and cinematic catastrophes. Subscribe to Cine Mysteria, where Hollywood's hidden stories come to light. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching, and see you in the next video.